On the 13th of May, as part of the um, Architecture Foundation 100 Day Programme, which is currently at the midway point, and of course, uh, this is part of it, I spoke about how the emptiness of the office, which my practice had decanted overnight, had enabled some uh, personal time to reflect on what we as a collective had been doing before, and also what we are doing now, and how we might emerge from the pandemic dust. Uh, it was an epic undertaking. Uh, involving assembling 16 years worth of working models onto the first floor of the office into which I placed myself. Uh, it was an immersive and deeply philosophical act of personal reflection. And during this period of reflection leading up to the mini lecture, it occurred to me that the act of lockdown had in fact created the conditions for a radical reassessment of the values and truths and in this case, the many um, being a practice, had clearly held dearly or accepted up to that point, perhaps blindly or without challenge. Now that we're free of the shackles, we could do other stuff uh, which might repair things which we've done before. So tonight's reading is an extension of the same catharsis. And in both cases, I'm seeking tools to influence outcomes for the positive, both for myself and those that um, know me and uh, work with me and uh, associate with me. So whilst the narrative may be a little somber, I'm aiming for high Jack and Ori, uh, as we read from a classic piece of storytelling. There are stories I recall reading as a child, whilst growing up in a working class town in the Midlands in the 1970s, which on reflection, during the tripart global crisis of health, climate and racism have surfaced in my thoughts. To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, published in 1960, which centers on Atticus Finch's attempt to prove the innocence of Tom Robinson, a black man who's been wrongly accused of raping a white woman in 1930s Alabama. And Lord of the Flies, a novel by the Nobel Prize winning British author William Golding, published in 1954, which focuses on a group of British boys stranded on an uninhabited island and their disastrous attempt to govern themselves. And thirdly, Animal Farm, written in 1945 by George Orwell, an allegory of Soviet history with a focus on the revolution and Bloody Sunday, one of the major contributing factors that changed Russia from a country in unrest to a country in revolution or revolt. All three novels are timeless classics which talk of social injustice, the misuse of politics and power, of greed, of prejudice, racism, exploitation, and in the case of Animal Farm, whilst not fundamental to the reading of the allegory, speciesism. All of them written over 60 years ago and all as highly relevant today as a lens to reflect on our own societal awakening. The story of Animal Farm is simple enough on face value but there is a degree of richness and complexity in its tale. The characters within are analogous of key protagonists of the Russian Revolution. The often drunk farmer, Jones, representing the last ruling emperor of all Russia, the Tsar Nicholas II, before his forced abdication in 1917. Old Major, loosely based on a fusion of Karl Marx and the revolutionary leader, Vladimir Lenin, a heavy old prize-winning boar who plants the vision of a socialist utopia in the collective minds of all the other farm animals. Napoleon, an antagonistic Berkshire boar representing Joseph Stalin. Snowball, a big white pig whose character is largely based on Leon Trotsky who led the opposition against Stalin. Boxer, a cart horse whose incredible strength, dedication and loyalty represent the Russian working class. Benjamin, a, a long-lived donkey who represents the intellectuals who failed to engage in politics and stand up to Stalin, and also worth mentioning, uh, Mr. Wimper, the human solicitor hired by Napoleon, representing the capitalists who traded with the Soviets. The narrative of the story describes animals, let's call them earthlings, uniting against their repressive captors and the extremes of poverty and enslavement, forcing an alliance of equality and overthrowing their repressors, working together for a common good, pledging allegiance to a new structured governance where all beings are equal, with prosperity experienced through shared endeavour and shared spoils, until gradually and almost imperceptibly, 
the ideals of the revolution slowly arose, returning the farm to a class system of elitist rulers presiding over an impoverished working class. In some loose way, I'm minded to reflect on the events surrounding the coronavirus crisis in early March, the overnight upheaval, the sense of revolution we were witnessing with cities in lockdown and imposed quarantine, the sense of panic gradually leading to a nervous sense of optimism and an increasing realization that radical is achievable. I recall images of dolphins and jellyfish swimming in the canals of Venice and the stories of wild animals infiltrating city centers and clearing of pollution from waters and skies. What a miracle. And here we are gradually firing up the boilers, turning the energy plants back on, filling the skies with planes, clogging the arteries of our cities with more cars, lorries and pollution, and slowly drifting back into the haze of our pre-COVID selves. Now, I'm sure most of you read this book at least once in your life, and so it isn't necessary to read all. Impossible in any case with just 20 or so minutes, even though it's just 94 pages long. So I'm simply going to read the first chapter and almost in its fullest to set the scene. And then perhaps we reflect on a few other areas. So here we go, chapter one. It's gonna be quite theatrical by the way, I'm gonna give it my all. Mr. Jones of the Manor Farm had locked the hen houses for the night but was too drunk to remember to shut the pop holes. With a ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery and made his way up to bed where Mrs. Jones was already snoring. As soon as the light in the bedroom went out, there was a stirring and a fluttering all through the farm buildings. Word had gone round during the day that old Major, the prize middle white boar, had had a strange dream on the previous night and wished to communicate it to the other animals. It had been agreed that they should all meet in the big barn as soon as Mr. Jones was safely out of the way. Old Major, so he was called, though the name under which he had been exhibited was, get this, Willingdon Beauty, was so highly regarded on the farm that everyone was quite ready to lose an hour's sleep in order to hear what he had to say. At one end of the big barn, on a sort of raised platform, Major was already ensconced on his bed of straw, under a lantern which hung from a beam. He was 12 years old and had lately grown rather stout, but he was still a majestic looking pig, with a wise and benevolent appearance in spite of the fact that his tushes had never been cut. Before long, the other animals began to arrive and make themselves comfortable after their different fashions. First came the three dogs, Bluebell, Jesse and Pincher, and then the pigs who settled down in the straw immediately in front of the platform. The hens perched themselves on the windowsills, the pigeons fluttered up to the rafters, the sheep and the cows lay down behind the pigs and began to chew cud. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came in together, walking very slowly and settling down their vast hairy hooves with great care, lest there should be some small animal concealed in the straw. Clover was a stout, motherly mare approaching middle life, who had never quite got her figure back after her fourth foal. Boxer was an enormous beast, nearly 18 hands high, and as strong as two ordinary horses put together. A white stripe down his nose gave him a somewhat stupid appearance, and in fact, he was not of all first-rate intelligence, but he was universally respected for his steadiness of character and tremendous powers of work. After the horses came Uriel, the white goat, and Benjamin the donkey. Benjamin was the oldest animal on the farm and the worst tempered. He seldom talked, and when he did, it was usually to make some cynical remark. For instance, he would say that God had given him a tail to keep the flies off, but that he would sooner have no tail and no flies. Alone among the animals on the farm, he never laughed. If asked why, he would say that he saw nothing to laugh at. Nevertheless, without openly admitting it, he was devoted to Boxer. The two of them usually spent their Sundays together in the small paddock beyond the orchard, grazing side by side and never speaking. The two horses had just laid down when a brood of ducklings, which had lost their mother, filled into the barn. 
cheeping feebly and wandering from side to side to find some place where they would not be trodden on. Clover made a sort of wall around them with her great foreleg and the ducklings nestled down inside it and promptly fell asleep. At the last moment, Molly, the foolish pretty white mare who drew Mr. Jones's trap, came mincing daintily in, chewing at a lump of sugar. She took a place near the front and began flirting her white mane, hoping to draw attention to the sort of red ribbons it was plaited with. Last of all came the cat, who looked around as usual for the warmest place and finally squeezed herself in between Boxer and Clover. There she purred contentedly throughout Major's speech without listening to a word of what he was saying, hopefully not like all of you who are listening. All the animals were now present except Moses, the tame raven, who slept on a perch behind the back door. When Major saw that they had all made themselves comfortable and were waiting attentively, he cleared his throat and began. <clears throat> Comrades, you have heard already about the strange dream that I had last night, but I will come to that dream later. I have, heard, I have something else to say first. I do not think, comrades, that I shall be with you for many months longer. And before I die, I feel it my duty to pass on to you such wisdom as I have acquired. I have had a long life and I have had much time for thought as I lay alone in my store. And I think I may say that I understand the nature of life on this earth as well as any animal now living. It is about this that I wish to speak to you. Now, comrades, what is the nature of this life of ours? Let's face it, our lives are miserable, laborious and short. We are born, we are given just so much food as will keep the breath in our bodies. And those of us who are capable of it are forced to work to the last atom of our strength and the very instant that our usefulness has come to an end, we are slaughtered with hideous cruelty. No animal in England knows the meaning of happiness or leisure after he is a year old. No animal in England is free. The life of an animal is misery and slavery. That is the plain truth. But is this simply part of the order of nature? Is it because this land of ours is so poor that it cannot afford a decent life to those who dwell on it? No, comrades, a thousand times no. The soil of England is fertile. Its climate is good. It is capable of affording food in abundance to an enormously greater number of animals than now inhabit it. This single farm of ours would support a dozen horses, 20 cows, hundreds of sheep and all of them living in comfort and a dignity that are now almost beyond our imagining. Why then do we continue in this miserable condition? Because nearly the whole of our produce, of our labor, is stolen from us by human beings. Their comrades is the answer to all our problems. It is summed up in a single word. Man is the only real enemy we have. Remove man from the scene and the root cause of our hunger and our work and our overwork is abolished forever. Man is the only creature that consumes without producing. He does not give milk. He does not lay eggs. He is too weak to pull the plow. He cannot run fast enough to catch the rabbits. Yet he is Lord of all the animals. He sets them to work. He gives them back to them the bare minimum that would prevent them from starving and he rests, he keeps for himself. Our labor tills the soil, our dung fertilizes it. And yet there is not one of us that owns more than his bare skin. You cows that I see before me, how many thousands of gallons of milk have you given during this last year? And what has happened to that milk which should have been breeding up sturdy calves? Every drop has gone down the throats of the enemy. And you hens, how many eggs have you laid in this last year? And how many of those eggs have ever hatched into chickens? The rest have all gone to market to bring in money for Jones and his men. And you, Clover, where are those four foals you bore? Who should have seen and support and pleasure through your old age? I lost my moment there. Each was sold at a year old. You will never see one of them again in return for your four confinements 
and all your labor in the fields, what have you ever had except bare rations and a stall? And even the miserable lives we lead are not allowed to reach their natural span. For myself, I do not grumble, for I am one of the lucky ones. I am 12 years old and have had over 400 children, such is the natural life of a pig. But no animal escapes the cruel knife in the end. You young porkers who are sitting in front of me, every one of you will scream your lives out at the block within a year. To that horror, we must all come. Cows, pigs, hens, sheep, everyone. Even the horses and the dogs have no better fate. You, boxer, the very day that those great muscles of yours lose their power, Jones will sell you to the knacker, who will cut your throat and boil you down for the foxhounds. As for the dogs, when they grow old and toothless, Jones ties a brick around their necks and drowns them in the nearest pond. Is it not crystal clear then, comrades, that all the evils of this life of ours spring from the tyranny of human beings? Only get rid of man and the produce of our labor would be our own. Almost overnight, we become rich and free. What then must we do? Why work day and night, body and soul for the overthrow of the human race? That is my message to you, comrades. Rebellion. I do not know when that rebellion will come. That is my message to you. It might be in a week or in a hundred years, but I know as surely as I see the straw beneath my feet that sooner or later justice will be done. Fix your eyes upon that, comrades. Throughout the short remainder of your lives, and above all, pass on this message of mine to those who come after you, so that future generations shall carry on that struggle until it is victorious. And remember, comrades, your resolution must never falter. No argument must lead you astray. Never listen when they tell you that man and the animals have a common interest, that the prosperity of the one is the prosperity of the others. It is all lies. Man serves the interests of no creature except himself, and amongst us animals let there be perfect unity, perfect comradeship in the struggle. All men are enemies, all animals are comrades. What do you think? I have a little more to say. I merely repeat, remember always your duty of enmity towards man, and as always, whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or as wings is a friend. And remember also that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. Even when you have conquered him, do not adopt his vices. No animal must ever live in a house or sleep in a bed or wear clothes or drink alcohol or smoke tobacco or touch money or engage in trade. All the habits of men are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind, weak or strong, clever or simple. We are all brothers. No animal must ever kill another animal. All animals are equal. I've lost about half the audience at this point, just to let you know. For those of you who are still with me, it's very good. And now, comrades, I will tell you about my dream of last night. I cannot describe that dream to you. It was a dream of the earth as it will be when man has vanished but it reminded me of something that I had long forgotten many years ago when I was a little pig. My mother and the other sows used to sing an old song of which they knew only the tune in the first three words. I had known that tune in my infancy, but it long since passed out of my mind. Last night, however, it came back to me in my dream. And what is more, the words of the song also came backwards. Words, I am certain, which were sung by the animals of long ago, and have been lost in memory for generations. I will sing you that song now, comrades. I am old and my voice is hoarse, but when I have taught you the tune, you can sing it better for yourselves. It is called Beasts of England. At which point, Old Major bleats out the words of a song. Now, I'm not going to sing the song, um, but I'm going to read it. Beasts of England, Beasts of Ireland, Beasts of every land and clime, hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. 
Sooner or later, the day is coming. Tyrant man shall be overthrown. And the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. Rings shall vanish from our noses and the harness from our back. Bitten spurs shall rust forever. Cruel whips no more shall crack. Riches more than mine can picture. Wheat and barley, oats and hay, clover beans and mango wurzel shall be ours upon that day. Bright will shine the fields of England. Purer shall its water be. Sweeter yet shall blow its breezes on the day that sets us free. For that day we all must labour, though we die before it break. Cows and horses, geese and turkeys, all must toil for freedom's sake. Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime, hearken well and spread my tidings of the golden future time. Pretty powerful stuff. So now we segue into chapter two, where the revolution commences with the uprising of the animals against their human repressors. This is where it gets tasty. June came and the hay was almost ready for cutting. On Midsummer's Eve, which was a Saturday, Mr. Jones went into Willingdon and got so drunk at the Red Lion that he did not come back until midday on Sunday. The men had milked the cows in the early morning and then gone out rabbiting without bothering to feed the animals. When Mr. Jones got back, he immediately went to sleep on the drawing room sofa with the news of the world over his face, so that when evening came, the animals were still unfed. At least, sorry, at last, they could no longer stand it. One of the cows broke in the front door of the store shed with her horn and all the animals began to help themselves from the bins. It was just then that Mr. Jones woke up. The next moment, he and his four men were in the store shed with whips in their hands, lashing out in all directions. This was more than the hungry, hungry animals could bear. With one accord, for nothing of the kind, had been planned beforehand, they flung themselves upon their tormentors. Jones and his men suddenly found themselves being butted and kicked from all sides. The situation was quite out of control. They had never seen animals behave like this before. And this sudden uprising of creatures whom they were used to thrashing and maltreating just as they chose, frightened them almost out of their wits. Only after a moment or two, they gave up trying to defend themselves and took to their heels. A minute later, all five of them were in full-flung flight down the car track that led to the main road, with the animals pursuing them in triumph. The animals had chased Jones and his men out onto the road and slammed the five-barreled gate behind them. And so, almost before they knew what was happening, the rebellion had successfully been carried through. Jones was expelled, and the manor farm was theirs. So this we drink. And so the story continues. The following day, the animals reveled and they rejoiced and they nervously explored the farm and their new dominion, breaking into the farmhouse, galloping around the boundaries of the farm to make sure that no human being was hiding anywhere upon it. Then they broke open the harness room and proceeded to destroy all the bits, the nose rings, the dog chains, the cruel knives which had been used to castrate the pigs and the lambs, which they do without any antibiotic or anesthetic, the reins, the halters, the blinkers, the degrading nose bags, the whips, and of course the, dec the decorative ribbons. The pigs now revealed that during the past three months, they had taught themselves to read and write from an old spelling book, which had belonged to Mr. Jones's children and which had been thrown on the rubbish heap. Napoleon sent for pots of black and white paint and led the way down to the five-barred gate that it gave onto the main road. Then Snowball, for it was Snowball who was best at writing, lest we not forget, took a brush between the two knuckles of his trotter, painted out Manor Farm from the top bar of the gate, and in its place, painted Animal Farm. This was to be the farm name from now onwards. After this, they went back to the farm buildings, where Snowball and Napoleon sent for a ladder, which they caused to be set against the end wall of the big barn. They explained that by their studies of the past three months, the pigs had succeeded in reducing the principles of animalism to seven commandments. 
These seven commandments would now be inscribed on the wall. They would form an unalterable, bold letters, law by which all the animals on Animal Farm must live for ever after. With some difficulty, for it is not easy for a pig to balance himself on a ladder, Snowball climbed up and set to work with Squealer, a few rungs below him, holding the pen pot, paint pot. The commandments were written on the tarred wall in great white letters that could be read 30 yards away. They ran thus. Number one, whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Number two, whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. Number three, no animal shall wear clothes. Number four, no animal shall sleep in a bed. Number five, no animal shall drink alcohol. Number six, no animal shall kill any other animal. And most importantly, number seven, all animals are equal. We're nearly there, guys. And so the story continues, the pigs gradually taking residence in the farmhouse, sleeping in the deserted beds, wearing clothes, eating at the tables, doing less and less work whilst the other animals toil and struggle in the fields, working longer hours and being fed less. And of course, in so doing, the pigs gradually break each of the commandments, one at a time, amending the core message of each for their own benefit. For example, commandment four is articulated with an additional emphasis identifying the use of sheets as the critical act. Or in commandment five, it isn't drinking alcohol, which is bad, just drinking in excess. And so on. And of course, the pigs impose increasing tyrannical rule over the other animals, eventually forcing them to build a windmill, which far from delivering the animals better lives as promised, it simply is intended to earn the pigs more money and thus increase their power. In fact, as we learn, the same said pigs who scribed the seven commandments following the overthrow of the human repressors by stealth remove all such commandments as it suits them and leave just the seventh commandment, albeit with a resounding adaptation of the message. And this is the big one. Animals are all equal, but some animals are more equal than others. In a self proclaimed recognition of the pig's own superiority, which is an obvious comment on the hypocrisy of governments that proclaim the absolute equality of their citizens, but give power and privileges to a small elite. And so we come to the closing paragraph of my 30 minutes, which has a spine chilling sense of foreboding and a guttural and horrific sense of deja vu. The creatures, and in brackets, who were assembled outside the farmhouse looking in at the scene of fattened pigs playing poker with their human counterparts, looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again. But already it was impossible to say which was which. And there we have it. An allegory for the 21st century, perhaps, a calling to arms to reflect upon and change, to drive for positivity, positivity, inclusivity, fairness, diversity of awareness and accountability. Reflect on this, the greatest social experiment in history. Tell your friends, colleagues, family, loved ones, of course, but do not stop there. Continue to voice the urgency and don't be like the pigs and become the image of their prior desperate image. I hope four legs good, and perhaps with the right focus, two legs good also. Thank you.